Talking about science, the how of life, and spirituality, the why of life, brings almost immediately a sense of dichotomy at minimum, and often a conflict or antinomy. This is mainly the result of the divergent developments between the two. It has not always been the case in human society. Antonio just gave us some example. There was even a moment in time where there was no differentiation between the two, where there were but two facets of the same human quest, the understanding of life. This dichotomy illustrates also a key characteristic of the human constitution. On one side, the use of the intellect, the use of our capability to sense, to measure to the universe, together with our mental capability to model all our perception. And on the other side, the non-mental aspect, driven by intuition, which give access to other dimensions of reality. The first is called natural science, the other one, universal science. And thank to Jose, now we know where are in our brain both parts. So science as spirituality is the search for the understanding of nature or reality. This is exactly what HPB, how she defines she define science. Our old lady says, science is an abstract of every fact, a comprehension of every truth within the scope of human research and intelligence. In a similar way, Professor Einstein expressed it. as science is a century-old endeavor to bring together, by means of systematic thought, the perceptible phenomena of this world into as thoroughgoing an association as possible. To put it boldly, it is the attempt at the posterior reconstruction of existence by the process of conceptualization. Let's have a quick look on the process themselves. The source of spirituality is most of the time the fruit of revelation, which source are lost in time, brought to humanity by divinity or their servant, and which content are carried on by traditions from one period of time to the other one, and from one continent to the other one. On most of the religious tradition, these revelations were veiled, masked, concealed, to give birth to, on one side, the mysteries, which access to was reserved and controlled, and on the other side, theology, a legislation, a codex, aimed for the people at large in order for the clergy to exercise temporal power over them. Of course, this is another simplification of what mystery and theology are. At the end of the day, spirituality, above the intellectual concept, is the boat which carries and guides us all along evolution toward the next step of our pilgrimage on the manifested world. What is important to keep in mind for the sake of this discussion is the word revelation. It is a mode of knowledge acquisition which soul substantiation, according to the guardian of faith, is a divine or supernatural source. This is one of the major difficulties in front of the scientific community. Madame Blavatsky wrote, had identified it when introducing her opus magnum, The Secret Doctrine. She wrote, it claims consideration, she was talking about the secret doctrine, not by reason of any appeal to dogmatic authority, but because it closely adheres to nature 
and follow the laws of uniformity and analogy. She also adds, it is above everything important to keep in mind that no theosophical book acquires the least additional value from pretended authority. On the other side, natural science is the resultant of the development of human intellect skills based on observation, analysis, modeling, inference, and cross-checking. It is mainly based on logic with mathematics as its supporting language. A key characteristic of science is what we can call the lineage mechanism. Any scientific discovery, whatever groundbreaking it is, is always the end result of a chain of previous scientific discovery. And most of the time, using the same thought scheme, it starts from an observation which cannot be explained by the current set of scientific law. That was the case with the black body radiation spectrum at the end of the 19th century. History of science seems to be full of genius who suddenly start a revolution in scientific concept by discovering new models, new way to interpret observation. In fact, these discoveries are most of the time sitting on the shoulder of all the past discoverers and it gives them the capability to see further. From time to time, it may look like a complete breakdown like the general relativity of Albert Einstein, which redefine the basic concept of time and space and demonstrate that any action at a distance cannot be instantaneous. But when you look at the history of the way uh, Albert Einstein came to this discovery, it is fairly based on most of the existing physics model at this time. Obviously, he was a genius to find out. A similar revolution started with Max Planck and the new physics, quantum physics, which emerged at the beginning of the 20th century. This was the beginning of a bigger earthquake because it shattered some strong common sense understanding, like the concept of causality and the fact that the localization and momentum of a particle cannot anymore be identified completely which means that we cannot anymore define the movement of a particle. And we've seen with Ulrich that we cannot even define position. But a close look at the history of this discovery shows a very tight link with previous physics, even if they provide with completely different models. What is important to remember in the mechanism which supports modern scientific research, observation, measurement, model, elaboration, prediction, and cross-checking with new observation. The key word is coherence, consistency. If a new observation does not match with model of prediction, then the door is fully open for a new science. There is no censorship. Any theory can be challenged. Of course, real life and all our society, including the scientific scientific society have their censorship and reluctance to accept new concepts. This, this is part of the difficulty for the universal science to penetrate inside this area. But at least we've reached a point in a period of time, we've reached a period of time where new scientific discovery can be aired and discussed freely and openly. The key question is, can spirituality alone or natural science lead us to the complete understanding of nature or reality? Probably not, otherwise we would not be discussing it today. The two aspects may be complementary, like the particle and the wave aspect of the quantum physics. Ultimate reality is a holistic whole which approach requires a holistic research method encompassing the integral constitution and capability of man. Let's see if there we can find some science contribution to spirituality. The first fundamental proposition from the secret doctrine is the omnipresent, eternal, boundless, and immutable principle, symbolized by absolute abstract space and absolute abstract motion. During the manifestation phase of it, this is the global substratum in which we are evolving. 
Therefore, nothing exists outside of it, and the universe must be ruled by one uniform set of law. This should be simple to understand. But we, as sparks of consciousness in our evolution rings, have added so much mental complexity and bias that a single truth became an infinity of different individual truths. Spirituality has degenerated in religions and philosophy which went away from real human experience. They have the tendency to become crystallized dogma which do not provide any more real support to the pilgrim on his way. Of course, that's another oversimplification. There has been and there is still awakened souls capable to experience and transmit the core of the teaching. But a quick look to the current state of the world showed us, shows us that there must be very few and very well hidden from the masses. Religion based on revelation does not leave any room for discussion and reconciliation with day-to-day -day fact and observation. Or, more accurately, they provide stereotyped answers for all questions, and if the answer is too far or too opposite to the recurrent fact, then it retreats behind the veil of revelation. On its side, science had to overcome in the Western world the yoke of secular Judeo-Christian tradition which controlled fiercely any attempt to challenge its dogma. It took centuries and martyrdom to emerge from obscurity. But then, when the door started to open, the pendulum went on full stop on the other side. Too happy to have killed the anthropomorphous god who had persecuted them for centuries, the 19th century scientists declared that science was or would be able to explain everything, including consciousness. It was the time of the positivists with Albert, Arthur Comte as their leading figure. It did not last long, but enough to crystallize the materialistic philosophy of life, at least in the scientific community. It was also the time, must have been some great time, where Madame Blavatsky published her opus magnum, The Secret Doctrine, announcing in her preface, the aim of this work may be thus stated, to show that nature is not a fortuitous concurrence of atoms, and to assign to men its, its rightful place in the scheme of the universe. Since this time, Science made tremendous progress, not only on discovery and theory, but also in its philosophy of science. The positivist attitude largely disappeared, even if it still resonated in some laboratory, and many of the science discoverers of the last 50 years have a much more humble attitude in front of reality. They publicly admitted, not all of them, that they just don't know about the universe fundamental principle. Richard Feynman, during one of his lecture on, famous lecture on physics in 1963, wrote and was teaching that it is important to realize that in the two-day physics, we have absolutely no knowledge of what energy is and why it is conserved. Of course, we know how to measure energy, we know the transformation scheme, but we have no scientific idea about what energy is. The same can be said about one of the fundamental processes observed and measured on Earth and now in the nearby space, planet, and other body like comets and asteroids. One of the fun fundamental ones, gravitation, remains a mystery, even if we can measure and predict its action on massive bodies. The current theory expects the discovery of the graviton, the particle which transmits the gravitational interaction. And a lot of effort and money have been deployed to detect gravitational waves since more than 20 years with no success as of today, even if we heard from time to time some discovery which are negated the following day. All these facts have opened up the Pandora box for 
new theory, and many cosmological models are proposed every month for testing. The interesting consequence of not knowing is an opening of the scientific mind, even if it concerns only a minority of scientists. As an example, David Bohm, physicist and philosopher, developed the concept of wholeness in an attempt to describe a reality in combining the ancient Greek philosophy and new scientific theory, like quantum physics. Somehow, like what the Illozoists in the, the ancient Greece taught long, long time ago. He, uh, David Bohm wrote in the 80s, reality can be considered as, in essence, a set of forms in an underlying universal movement or process. Our general worldview is itself an overall movement of thought, which has to be viable in the sense that the totality of activity that flow out of it are generally in harmony, both in themselves and with regard to the whole of its existence. Of existence. This is an example of science contribution to spirituality where the holistic approach allows for a greater thought scheme to encompass more than pure observation and induction. Now let's move to the way forward from that. We can sense that uh, after a period of infancy, a long period of infancy, science can converge towards spirituality for the benefit of humanity. Madame Blavatsky was very clear on this possibility. She also put forward the condition for success. So far as science remains organized common sense, so far as its inferences are drawn from accurate to premise, its generalization resting on purely inductive basis, every theosophist and occultist welcomes respectfully and with due admiration its contribution to the domain of cosmological view, law. On the other side, science, we have also scientists convinced of the added value of science for spirituality. Another one. Albert Einstein said, by way of the understanding through the rational unification of the manifold that it encounters to the smallest possible number of mutually independent conceptual elements, man achieves a far-reaching emancipation from the shackle of personal hope and desire. Therefore, attain that humble attitude of mind toward the grandeur of reason incarnated in existence and which, in its profoundest depth, is inaccessible to him. You can see that this, uh, it was a great seer capable to really understand the wholeness, the oneness. So the next question is why it does not work? We have two parties ready to commit together. Why it does not work? Why, why most of the scientific community stay away from spirituality in their scientific work, of course? Why, when some scientific scientists decide to explore new territory, including the study of unknown form, force or phenomena, they are ostracized? These are key questions which need to be answered before a clear solution can be identified. We have already seen the existing difference between methodology, intellect versus intuition revelation. But this does not prevent bridges to be built. There is enough space and common ground to work on it. Let's have a look on some current example. I, lo I love this one. Theosophy teaches that all the cells of a human body are replaced by new one every seven years. Science has witnesses, witnessed this process of replication and came with the following. We have roughly, please remain seated, 100,000 billion of cells inside our body. Linked together, they would represent a chain of 15,000 kilometers. Every day in our body, 
Currently, for every one of us, 20 billion of cells will die and will be replaced by new one. I'm sure we did not notice that. The regeneration cycles take from some hours for the blood cells to 15 years for the ribs bones, which give an average around 10 years. So the process is recognized by both wisdom tradition and science with a similar order of magnitude for the rate. That's also, by the way, a very good example uh, about the fact that we are inhabiting the body. We are not aware of many things which are, are happening inside. Another example about one of the key processes in our cosmos. I'm back to gravitation. I love it. Madame Blavatsky clearly highlights the fact that gravitation has fundamentally an electrical nature. That must be puzzling. In 2006, two Swedish scientists, Professors N. Johansson and Pervar Johansson, published a completely new theory based on the property of the vacuum polarization. And we will not go, don't, don't worry about it. Um, and coherent with most of the last century major discovery introducing a new model for the structure of the vacuum. Vacuum is uniformly filled of electrical neutral particles called vacuums, which are essentially completely at rest in the absence of external disturbance. And a vacuum is composed of an N vacuum and a P vacuum endowed with electrical charge. So this is not to say, OK, Eureka, we find something. That is just to illustrate the fact that the more we go, the more we have an opening on the science side, which may, which may one day uh, be a real breakthrough in terms of connecting with a spirituality. Of course, out of, I don't know, 10, 15, 50 proposals, most of them don't uh, go through the test and uh, they, they are rejected. But at least that idea which we would like probably to explore. There are many other examples of door opening from the scientific community. Maybe it is a sign that the time is ripe for building some bridges between science and spirituality. But a key roadblock remains to overcome, I'm sorry. A roadblock quite difficult to pinpoint and to resolve. What modern psychology called the ego. It is one of the key characteristics of man constitution at the heart of almost all our thoughts, speeches, and action, with a very tricky and subtle behavior. It grabs everything with, which comes to its attention through the sense and the memory, just to keep existing. It waits any situation in order to decide what is best for the sake of its survival. It is fueled by desires, and it is driving us, and therefore the world, toward more for me, the ego. This is the lord of materialism, the lord of the lie. Sometimes a cartoon is better than 1,000 pages of script. Yes, we don't want to let it go, even if we are ready to to, to go in a precipice, we don't want to let it go. All spiritualities, including theosophy, have identified this as the major point to be resolved for the dawn of the divine light in our existence. Taming the mind and discerning the real is one of the favorite themes in Buddhism, and Saint John of the Cross, together with most of the Christian mystics, recommend to devote all thoughts, speeches, and action to the divine in order to cut the feeding of the ego. As a conclusion, science and spirituality are two complementary aspects of human development, and they have a common goal, to understand nature or reality. Spirituality, based on revelation and realization, is all-encompassing. Science is a step-by-step, -step, mainly intellectual process, working inside a limited number of dimensions or plan. But both scientists and spiritual are, first of all, men.
or women, of course, together with their limitation at the current stage of development of humanity, including the ego. Having a common goal and a common vehicle, they must cross-feed each other and converge. For that to happen, there is a need for a common set of value, a common language and bridges between the key concept of spirituality and the fact and discovery of science. To quote again, but that's the last time, Albert Einstein. And uh, you've already seen that. Science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. He had a realistic and profound, profound understanding of reality. To the question about it, do you think that we shall ever probe the secret? The answer, possibly we shall know a little bit more than we do now. It was in 1929. But the real nature of things that we shall never know, never. And finally, we need to be realistic and patient. On both sides, we, ha we have to be ready to challenge some of the beliefs and some of the scientific models. The uh, Buddhist teaching was able to go through 2,500 years because it, every time it adapted either to the civilization or the time where it was, and it is still very uh, flourishing today. If you have a chance to meet with current teacher of Buddhism, especially in, in Western world, you'll see that they have completely adapted their teaching to the environment, not changing anything on the basic roots and value, but adapting it to keep it a living teaching. That's, I think, what we will need to do. Life is a living process. Life is a living process which unfolds itself on a continuous basis. Life is a wonderful, evolving mechanism. Let us flow inside its magnificent current, equipped with a luminous life vest, love, before we can walk on the waters. Thank you very much.